Today, we are honored this morning to have with us Bill Rose of Citigroup, who will continue yesterday's discussion on investing in China. And we're deeply honored to have Bill today, because apparently he was asked by Hank Paulson this morning to have breakfast with him. And he said he can. He has a commitment at C100. So thank you so much, Bill. As you may know, Citigroup, the world's largest financial services company, has had some good news lately. A 15% increase in group revenues, acquisition of a very successful hedge fund, and a major cost-cutting initiative. There is positive news in China as well. Last month, Citigroup and three other banks were allowed to become the first foreign banks to offer expanded retail services to Chinese companies. Citibank has had a long history in China and, and, and had extensive relationship with China. They were the first foreign bank in China in 1902. They left China in 1950, then once again was one of the first back in 1983. Growing up personally, Citibank was a household name, and it is for many Chinese families, which inspired me to work there for five years. But that's a whole different story. To talk about Citigroup today, we have Bill Rhodes, who holds a multitude of titles. He is Senior Vice Chairman of Citigroup NA. I'm sorry, Senior Vice Chairman of Citigroup. He is Chairman, President, and CEO of Citibank NA. He is also Chairman, President, and CEO of Citicorp Holdings. Quite a mouthful. Bill joined Citibank in 1957 after graduating from Brown University. Early on, he developed a strong re reputation for international financial diplomacy. He has been a leader in managing the external debt crisis involving developing nations in the 80s and 90s. And today, he is responsible for Citigroup's relations with institutions and governments. With regard to China, uh, Bill actually has a secret weapon. He has a Chinese fiance whom he has been engaged to and been with for six years. And but more than that, Bill has been quoted as saying, China is our number one investment destination globally. China-U.S. relations is evolving into the most important bilateral relationship in the world. I could cite the list of honors he has received and the many boards he serves on. It's a huge, long list, but there will be no time. Therefore, the Committee of 100 is deeply honored to have with us today Mr. William Rhodes. Thank you, William. Thank you, Anla, for your kind introduction. You can see by her commentary that she was a city banker at one time. <clears throat> I appreciate this uh, turnout at, uh, at this hour, and uh, I have great admiration for the, the committee of 100. I have a number of friends who are members, and uh, I think you're known for your dedication uh, and the work you do on improving Chinese-American relations. Today, I would like to share with you some views on China's economy, financial system, and what I think has been achieved and what needs to be done going forward, and talk a little bit also about China's role in the world economically and geopolitically. <clears throat> As Anla said, my institution opened its first doors in China in Shanghai in 1902. Uh, <clears throat> Lulo said, Bill, can you say something that, you know, about the relationship uh, of Citibank, Wachi Bank as it's known in the flower flag bank in China, be interest. Well, in our, in our boardroom, <clears throat> there, are two, there are two things hanging on the wall. One <clears throat> is the flag when we were founded, uh, our institution in 1812. The other is the uh, <clears throat> flag, the flower flag, that flew over our operation in Shanghai until 1937. <clears throat> when we obviously were forced to take it down. Uh, but I think that shows the commitment of our institution to China. We have been rebuilding our operation over the last few years, and we now have six major cities in China with 19 branch outlets. We have, lo we have operations uh, in many areas, and we have investments in two local banks, Shanghai Pudong Development Bank, and more recently, Guangdong Development Bank. We own a software house, processing centers, call centers, and a major training center. We are very much committed to the market today and tomorrow. 
and uh, we have a number of plans uh, for increasing our participation as we are allowed by regulations. Personally, I've been involved with China since our re-entry in 1983 and have been a regular visitor since 1993. I try to go there approximately five times a year, if not more. I was last there last month at the China Development Council meeting, which is run by the State Council and the, and the Premier, Wen Jibao. And I will be going again next week to open a branch in Hangzhou and to attend the meeting of the Group of 30, uh, which is being hosted by Governor Zhou Xiaoxuan of the People's Bank of China. I think we're all aware of what China has done since, 1970, uh, since 1979, where I think the real opening began. Uh, the world has seen nothing like it. And I think particularly since 1992, when Deng Xiaoping gave his favorite speech in Shenzhen, <clears throat> the rise has just been, of China has just been incredible. And I think most people would agree that if China keeps up at this rate, it'll become the world's largest economy within the next 25 years. The U.S. and China together account for almost half of economic growth in the world. Uh, this was the case in, in 2006 and approximately one-third of total economic output were, and were the lead engines of the global economy. I believe the most important bilateral relationship in the world today and tomorrow is between China and the United States. And if this relation is good, then things will be good in the world, both economically and geopolitically. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is just say a few words about the global economy and then move on to the financial sector uh, in China. I think we're living in what I refer to as a Goldilocks economy worldwide. This was a phrase coined by my friend Alan, Belder, when, uh, Alan uh, Blinder when he was at the Federal Reserve in the 90s, applying to the U.S., but I think you can apply this to the world today. And basically what this has been driven by is record or near record levels of liquidity internationally. And I think we've seen hedge funds, private equity firms, now control huge amounts of capital and are competing for investment opportunities and financial assets. Portfolio management techniques, credit derivatives, and other risk mitigants have increased our ability to diversify and manage risk, but have also emboldened investors worldwide to assume more risk. How these new financial instruments, risk management tools, and financial market players, and I would say many of them uh, who are using highly sophisticated computer-driven models and trading systems will respond to a market crisis or to a receding of liquidity, I think, is anybody's guess. Uh, this situation is compounded by the fact that the new players and, indeed, the market seem to have forgotten some of the lessons of the past crises, notably the 1997 Asian financial crisis, which went on to Russia and then to long-term capital in 1998. 